Whereupon, in a short time, they arrived at Orkney, where two gentlemen of their company going ashore were taken prisoners and carried to Edinburgh, whereby the country was alarmed and a huge host gathered to oppose them. From whence they went to the West Highlands, where, increasing to the number of about two thousand men, they traversed to and again about Kintyre and Butte and other places in the Highlands for six or seven weeks, until many of their men ran away, and the rest were much straited for want of victuals. Their passage by sea was blocked up by ships of war, and by land with their numerous enemies, who got time to gather and strengthen themselves, whereby their friends were frustrate and more oppressed, and themselves kept little better than prisoners, till their spirits were wearied and worn out, and all hope lost. At length the earl determined, when out of time, to leave the highlands, and the ships, cannons, arms, and ammunition at Island Craig, and marched toward Dumbarton, crossing the water of Levin, about three miles above it. Next morning, near Duntraith, they discovered a party of the enemy, and faced towards them, but they retired, and then directed their course towards Glasgow, where uh, were intercepted by a body of the enemy's army, where they drew up in a battalion one against another, and stood in arms till the evening, a water betwi being betwixt them. But Argyle's party, perceiving that their enemies were above ten times their number, and that, them, and that themselves were wearied out with a long and tedious march, want of victuals and sleep, resolved to withdraw. But as soon as it grew dark, all hope lost, they dispersed, every man shifting for himself, only a few keeping together all the next day, had a skirmish with a party of the enemy, in which they slew the captain, and about twelve or some more of his men, and afterwards they dispersed themselves also. The enemy, searching the country, gleaned up the Earl of Argyle himself, Colonel Rumble, an Englishman, Mr. Thomas Archer, minister, Gavin Russell, and David Law, who were all condemned and executed at Edinburgh, and many others who were banished to America, and about some twenty to the Highlands, who were hanged at Inverary. In England, the Duke of Monmouth's expedition, though it had more action, yet terminated in the same success, the loss of many hundred lives, many killed in battle, and afterwards by the mercy of the Duke of York, several hundreds in the west of England were carried about and hanged before the doors of their own habitations, and to make his captain sport by the way, according to the number of the hours of the day, when the murdering humor came in their head, so many of the poor captives were hanged as a prodigious monument of the monstrous cruelty. This was the commencement of the present tyrant's government, in the meantime, the wanderers in Scotland, though they did not associate with this expedient, uh, with this expedition, excuse me, upon the account of the two promiscuous admittance of persons to trust in that party, who were then and since have discovered themselves to be enemies to the cause, and because they could not espouse their declaration as the state of their quarrel, being not only concerted according to the constant plea of the Scots covenanters, and for other reasons given in their late vindication. Yet against this usurpation of a bloody papist, advancing himself to the throne in such a manner, they published another declaration at San Juan, May twenty eighth, sixteen fifty or sixteen eighty five, excuse me, quote, wherein approving and adhering unto all their former declarations, and considering that James Duke of York, York, a professed and excommunicate papist, was proclaimed to testify their resentment of that deed, and to make it appear unto the world that they were free thereof by concurrence or connivance. They protest against the foresaid proclamation of James, Duke of York, as king, in regard that it is the choosing of a murderer to be a governor who hath shed the blood of the saints, that it is the height of confederacy with an idolater, forbidden by the law of God, contrary to the declaration of the General Assembly of the Church, July 27, 1649, and contrary to the many wholesome and laudable acts of Parliament, and inconsistent with the safety, faith, conscience, and Christian liberty of a Christian people, to choose a subject of Antichrist to be their supreme magistrate, and to entrust an enemy to the work and people of God with the interests of both, and upon many important grounds and reasons which there they express, they protest against the validity and constitution of that Parliament, approving and ratifying the foresaid proclamation, and against all kind of popery in general and particular heads, as abjured by the National Covenant and abrogated by Acts of Parliament, and against its entry into, again, this land, and everything that doth or may directly or indirectly make way for the same, disclaiming likewise all sectarianism, malignancy, and any confederacy therewith." Unquote. This was their testimony against popery in the season thereof, 
which, though it was not so much condemned as any former declarations, yet neither in this had they the concurrence of any ministers or professors, who, as they had been silent and omitted a seasonable testimony against prelacy and the supremacy when these were introduced, so now also, even when this wicked mystery and conspiracy of popery and tyranny, twisted together in the present design of Antichrist, had made so great a progress, and was evidently brought above board, they were left to let slip this opportunity of a testimony also to the reproach of the declining and far degenerate Church of Scotland, yea, to their shame. The very rabble of ignorant people may be brought as a witness against the body of Presbyterian ministers in Scotland, in that they testify their detestation of the first erection of the idolatrous mass and some of the soldiery, and such as had no profession of religion, suffered unto death for speaking against popery and the designs of the king, while the ministers were silent, and some of the curates and members of the late parliament, 1686, made some stickling against the taking away, against the taking away, excuse me, of the penal statutes against papists, while Presbyterians, from whom might have been expected greater opposition, were sleeping in a profound submission. I cannot without confusion of spirit touch these obvious and dolorous reflections, and yet in candor cannot forbear them. However, the persecution against the wanderers went on, and more cruel edicts were given forth against them, while a relenting abatement of severity was pretended against other dissenters. At length, what could not be obtain obtained by law at the late Parliament for taking off the statutes against papists was effectuated by prerogative, and to make it pass with the greater approbation, it was conveyed in a channel of pretended clemency, offering a sort of liberty, but really introducing a licentious latitude for bringing in all future snares by taking off some former as arbitrarily as before they were imposed in a proclamation dated February 12, 1687. Quote, granting by the king's sovereign authority, prerogative royal, and absolute power, which all subjects are to obey without reserve, a royal toleration to the several professors of the Christian religion after named, with and under the several conditions, restrictions, and limitations after mentioned, in the first place, tolerating the moderate Presbyterians to meet in their private houses, and there to hear all such ministers as either have or are willing to accept of the indulgence Eleanorly, and none other, and that there be nothing said or done contrary to the well and peace of this of his reign, excuse me, seditious or treasonable under the highest pains of these crimes will import. Nor are they to presume to build meeting houses or to use outhouses or barns. In the meantime, it is his royal will and pleasure that field conventicles and such as preach at them, or who shall any way assist or connive at them shall be prosecuted according to the utmost severity of laws made against them, in like manner tolerating the Quakers to meet and exercise in their form in any places or place appointed for their worship, and by the same absolute power foresaid, suspending, stopping, and disabling all laws or acts of Parliament, customs, or constitutions against any Roman Catholic subjects, so that they shall in all things be as free in all respects as any Protestant subjects whatsoever, not only to exercise their religion, but to enjoy all offices, benefices, etc., which he shall think fit to bestow upon them in all time coming, and casting, annulling, and discharging all oaths whatsoever, and tests and laws in joining them, and in place of them this oath only is to be taken. I, A, B, do acknowledge, testify, and declare that James the Seventh, etc., is rightful king and supreme governor of these realms, and over all persons therein, and that it is unlawful for subjects on any pretense, or for any cause whatsoever, to rise in arms against him, or any commissionated by him, and that I shall never for rise in arms, nor assist any who shall do so, and that I shall never resist his power or authority, nor ever oppose his authority to his person, but shall to the utmost of my power assist, defend, and maintain him, his heirs, and lawful successors, in the exercise of their absolute power and authority against all deadly, and by the same absolute power, giving his full and ample indemnity to all the foresaid sorts of people under the foresaid restrictions." Unquote. Here is a proclamation for a prince that proclaims him, in whose name it is emitted, to be the greatest tyrant that ever lived in the world, and their revolt who have disowned him to be the justest that ever was. 
For herein that monster of prerogative is not only advanced, paramount to all laws, divine and human, but far surmounting all the lust, impudence, and insolence of all the Roman, Sicilian, Turkish, Tartarian, and Indian tyrants who have ever trampled upon the liberties of mankind, who have indeed demanded absolute subjection and surrender of their lives, lands, and liberties at their pleasure, but never arrived at such a height of arrogance as this does, to claim absolute obedience without reserve of conscience, religion, honor, or reason, not only that which ignorantly is called passive, never to resist him, only, uh, not only on any pretense, but for cause, even though he should command his popish janissaries to murder and massacre all Protestants, which is the tender mercy and burning fervent charity of papists, but also of absolute active obedience without reserve, to assist, to defend, and maintain him in everything whereby he shall be pleased to exercise his absolute power, though he should command to burn the Bible as well as the covenant, as already he applauded John Gibb in doing of it, and to burn and butcher all that will not go to the mass, which we have all grounds to expect will be the end of his clemency at last. Herein he claims a power to command what he will, and obliging subjects to obey whatsoever he will command, a power to rescind, stop, and disable all laws, which unhinges all stability and unsettles all the security of human society, yea, extinguishes all that remains of natural liberty, wherein, as well observed, excuse me, as is well observed by the author of the representation of the threatening dangers impending over Protestants, page 53, quote, it is very natural to observe that he allows the government under which we were born and to which we were sworn to be hereby subverted and changed, and that thereupon we are not only absolved and acquitted from all allegiance to him, but indispensably obliged by the ties and engagements that are upon us to apply ourselves to the use of all means and endeavors against him as an enemy of the people and subverter of the legal government." Unquote. But this was so gross and grievously gripping in its restrictions as to persons, as to the place, as to the matter allowed the Presbyterians in preaching, that it was disdained of all, and therefore he behooved to busk it better and mend the matter in a letter to the council, the Supreme Law of Scotland, bearing the date March 31st, 1687, of this tenor, quote, Whereas we did recommend to you to take care that any of the Presbyterians should not be allowed to preach, but such only as should have your allowance for the same, and that they, at the receiving of the indulgence, should take the oath contained in the proclamation. These are therefore to let you know that thereby we meant such of them as did not solemnly take the test, but if nevertheless the Presbyterian preachers do scruple to take the said oath, or any other oath whatsoever, and that you shall find it reasonable or fit to grant them or any of them our said indulgence, so as they desire it upon these terms. It is now our will and pleasure to grant them our said indulgence without being obliged to take the oath with power unto them to enjoy the benefit of the said indulgence during our pleasure only, or so long as you shall find they behave themselves regularly and peaceably without giving any cause of offense to us or any in authority or trust under us in our government." Unquote. Thus finding the former proposal not adequately apportioned to his design because of its palpable odiousness, he would pretend that his meaning was mistaken, though it was manifest enough, and mitigate the matter by taking away the oaths altogether, if any should scruple it, whereas he could not but know that all that had sense would abhor it. Yet it is clogged with the same restrictions, limited to the same persons, characterized more plainly and peremptorily with an addition of cautions, not only that they shall not say or do anything contrary to the will and peace of his reign, seditious or treasonable, but also that they behave themselves regularly and peaceably without giving any cause of offense to him or any under him, which comprehends lesser offenses than sedition or treason, even everything that will displease a tyrant and a papist, that is, all faithfulness in seasonable duties or testimonies.